Well, thank you, Katie. Uh, no pressure there. <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to perform. Uh, well, we're, we're among friends, right? I can sort of dis dismiss with the jacket. Okay, good. Thank you. Is this better? Okay. Oh, don't worry. We're, we're, we're going to get seriously loud. Now, um, some of you uh, may, may be wondering about my attire, you know, with this uh, maroon shirt on, and you just heard about my studying with Bill Getzman and, uh, at the University of Texas, and I just wanted to let you know that my burnt orange one is at the dry cleaners. So, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, that's how that happened. Um, and just to let you know, Here's our title for today. Uh, Carl Hermann Lundqvist and Other German Artists, 1851 to 1901, which stretches things just a wee bit beyond Hermann Lundqvist's time because he lived in Texas for 40 years from 1851 to his death in 1891. Um, and we stretched it forward just a wee bit in order to uh, finish up with a look at a couple of the, the paintings of Julius Stockfleth. But um, so I was thinking in terms of this talk, well, how do I kick the can further down the road than I did in Houston at the David B. Warren Symposium? And a large part of that was thinking in terms of the other German artists, the relationships between them to the degree that there were relationships between them, because we are talking about a pretty wide period uh, of, of time here. Uh, but these are uh, five of the usual suspects. We don't have Julius Stockfleth here, but we, we do have Hermann Lundqvist up at the top. His, uh, uh, best bud, uh, Richard, Richard Petrie, down at the lower right. Um, his business partner, uh, uh, Lundqvist's business partner, Karl von Ivansky. Uh, his pupil, Ida uh, uh, Weisselberg Hadra, and Luisa Vusta. Um, so there, there are all sorts of interesting connections uh, between these, be it as a, a friend, as a colleague, as a, a, a mentor pupil sort of sort of relationship. Many immigrant artists from, from Europe came to Texas with academic training, while others were self taught or were taught informally in Europe and or in Texas. Some of these immigrants proceeded to teach art in Texas and even encouraged some native born Texans to study art in Europe. European immigrant artists and their followers not only had a certain type of training, but a certain way of framing their art. Some of their work was in genres that were not typical of uh, Texas in the antebellum or mid-19th century. Um, specifically, in, in, at the early times, you see portraits and landscapes. But immigrant artists tended to see art where their Anglo-American peers saw only the background of a painting. So that's, that's one thing that, that I want you to be sort of attended to, uh, attending to as we look at this. Um, and in, in this uh, 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 image here, we actually have two graduates of the Academy of Fine Arts in Dresden, that being uh, Herman at the upper left and Petri at the, uh, the lower right. Uh, Luisa Vusta actually was deeply embedded in uh, Dusseldorf, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, Karl von Ivansky is probably the least formally trained of the group that you see here. Um, the, the interesting thing, or one of the things that's very significant about him is that he came, fr his father, before becoming a farmer in the New Braunfels area, had been a Prussian military officer. And being being an officer in the military brings with it a certain level of graphic sophistication. And, and you, know, you, you know that from seeing the, the drawings of Seth Eastman or a, a lot of the other um, images created by uh, Army Exploration of the American West, to use the phrase of Dr. Getzman's. Um, so uh, in spite of the fact that he did not have a terribly formal training, there, there was a certain level of sophistication there coming out of his, uh, his, his father and, and that sort of upbringing. And then Ida, um, living in uh, uh, Austin, Texas, uh, ended up studying with Herman Lundqvist. So there's, there's kind of a, uh, uh, an, an indirect connection of, um, um, the, with, with the European academies. So um, let's see what else we can see here. Yeah, and so we're gonna talk about the background of the, the painters, as I was saying, both uh, Herman Lundqvist and Richard Petri uh, learned their art in Dresden in the late 1830s and early 1840s. Now, at that point, the the uh, importance, the 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 uh, uh, 
of Caspar David Friedrich, the most important German romantic painter, was still very strong. He had been on the faculty at Dresden for quite a long while. Unfortunately, he had become very ill by the time that Lundqvist and Petri showed up. And so it, it was more of an indirect influence because both of their main professors, uh, uh, Johann, Kasp, uh, uh, Johann Christian Dahl and Adrian Ludwig Richter, uh, both had studied with uh, um, uh, with uh, Friedrich. So in fact, when, and here in fact is uh, Schinkel and Dahl and, and Richter. So unclear whether Lungfritz ever uh, got to meet uh, the, and actually, yeah, Schinkel, never mind Schinkel rather than Friedrich. Uh, but so the Dahl and Richter were in fact the two key uh, 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 influences on uh, Lungfritz and Petri. And just in pulling this, this talk together, I realized that there's, there's kind of an interesting opportunity because Caspar David Friedrich, um, both Dahl and uh, Richter and Hermann Lundqvist all did paintings of the same scene. So you can actually look and, and compare. This is actually 1824-25, uh, a, uh, a view of Der Watzmann. And uh, this distinctive uh, pink, uh, peak, uh, the configuration of this lower craggier one and then uh, this one. Uh, this is based on a drawing that had been done by another of Friedrich's students and this is actually in the uh, National Museum in Oslo, which is where a, a lot of Dahl's uh, stuff, he was uh, Norwegian, uh, so a lot of his stuff ended up in, uh, in Oslo. But this uh, watercolor had been done by one of Friedrich's students who then uh, died, and it's, there's almost kind of a, a memorial aspect to the Friedrich painting, but at the same time, and this is the same time he's doing the, uh, Friedrich is doing the, the Arctic icebergs painting, which is really quite remarkable. But the, the two main professors of Hermann Lundqvist did their own version of uh, Der Watzmann at about the same time, and you can see uh, that Dahl is, is much closer to uh, Friedrich, and in fact, Dahl had lived in, in Friedrich's household in Dresden, um, whereas uh, uh, Adrian Ludwig Richter uh, has uh, more, uh, less, less emphasis on the grandeur and overwhelming powerful beauty of the scene um, that you see in the Dahl, and this one, uh, which is uh, actually in uh, Munich now, um, has more buildings, more incident, and, and there, there are all sorts of almost a, a humanizing, just sort of a, a more domesticated landscape, shall we say. And then it turns out that 20 years later, Hermann Lundqvist also did a version of the Wachtman, and this is in the private collection of uh, James and Kimmel Baker. And it's kind of interesting because it combines, as everyone has, that peak. It's becoming more recessed in this view, and there's a, a much stronger focus on this single building. So it's not as cluttered, dare I say, not as domesticated as the, the, the Richter painting was. Um, but uh, nevertheless, seems to be uh, attempting to find a middle ground between Dahl and, and Richter and coming up with his own individualistic view of uh, this, this particular European landscape scene. Um, so just to very quickly mention a couple of the other educational, uh, the, the educational background of a couple of other people. Uh, Louisa uh, Vusta, who came to Texas in the late 1850s, so she got there not quite a decade after Lundqvist and Petrie, and she was a widow at the time. She'd been married to a doctor, and her adult children had emigrated to Texas. And so like two years later, uh, she decided to, to follow them and found herself in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, she was a native of Gummersbach in um, the North, North Rhine area, Westphalia, and Wusta uh, later ended up living in Dusseldorf. And her aunt was a, a woman named Henrietta um, uh, Heuser Jugel, and uh, she was uh, an artist herself. This watercolor is by Luisa's aunt Henrietta. So uh, there, there's obviously um, uh, talent running in the family. Her sister Adelaide, who was also known as Adelina, was also a painter. Her sister Ida married the painter Carl Friedrich Lessing, who is this dude right here. Um, so a pretty prominent mid-19th century uh, German painter, and her youngest sister, Alvina, married Adolf Schroeter, who um, is not in, in this painting, but he was a, a, a painter and an engraver. 
And the, interestingly enough, the middle figure here, uh, uh, Carl Fried, uh, Ferdinand Sohn, was actually an instructor of Louisa Wuster while she was living in uh, Dusseldorf. And here's an image. Uh, I, he obviously thinks that his left side is his best side here, because you find, see it in both of those uh, paintings. But this is, this is an interesting uh, image of the, the painter in his studio. And uh, I look at this, and I immediately think, oh, look at that chair. Uh, you, you <laughs> I know, I'm a geek. What can I say? Um, it, it's a chair that you might find in New Braunfels, Texas in the 1850s or 1860s. Um, so it, it's sort of that, that sort of shift from the, 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 the late neoclassical um, long story. But also interesting in this image, that it's kind of a catalog of G Germanic ideas, because you notice how there's this shelf over the doorway? You can find that in some German texts in homes as well. Like if you go to the, the Johann Peter Tatsch House in Fredericksburg, there's a built-in shelf between the, the two front rooms. So that's kind of interesting, seeing these, these attitudes or ideas that, that you know, uh, people uh, from Germany brought with them to Texas, which of course is one of the, 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 the light motifs of my book, The Material Culture of German Texans, available over in the art fair. Just a little product placement there. That will happen from time to time this morning. So, um, just basically we're going to take a quick look at the genre of portraits and the genre of landscape. And then we're going to look at the way in which German immigrant painters uh, participated in what we might call genre bending, things that don't quite fit into any one of our typical conceptions of history painting, portraits, uh, landscapes, uh, but, but are actually uh, 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 quite, quite unusual and distinctive and is one of the things by which we can characterize them. So uh, this is one of my favorite 19th century Texas portraits, and it's a portrait of our buddy, Herman Lunkfitz here. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll t tell you a dirty little secret. I can't, I can't say for certain that this was actually painted in Texas. Uh, it, in, in the catalogs, it's always circa 1850, and that's one heck of a circa, <laughs> because when, you know, when, when you've got that, um, you know, 1850 is the date that the family moved to Texas, so if it's circa one year older, it's a, it was painted in Germany, uh, one year later, definitely in Texas, or who knows, it could have been done in West Virginia if you're being quite literal about that. Be that as it may, uh, uh, he, he's our guy, so we don't have to really have to worry about it that much. But painted by his uh, good friend, Richard uh, Petri. Interestingly enough, um, it also has, and this is in the collections of the Texas Governor's Mansion, it's in the front parlor now. Um, you'll notice that he's wearing a little pin in the, the, the portrait, and this pin was donated or, or acquired with the painting and is actually in this little matching frame just under the painting. Now, in addition to, to Herman and his uh, mother and his sister Teresa, his younger brother Adolf Lunkfetz came to Texas t as well and settled in Fredericksburg. Uh, Herman and Richard were on a farm south of town. Uh, but Adolf was a silversmith and tinsmith. And so that's kind of an interesting concept. Could this, in fact, be something produced by his younger brother Adolf? Don't know, but it's just, just sort of one of those tantalizing questions that, uh, that, that we can look at. But it's a, a, a really nice uh, painting, super formal, and one that um, uh, emphasizes the gentlemanly character of Herman Lunkwitz. This is not really your sort of hill country farmer image that you tend to expect. And it's showing him, su suggesting that he's, he's a man, to, man of, of intellect, but also a man of taste. And that's that sort of uh, uh, balance that, that, that painters are trying to, to position themselves on in the, the 18th and 19th century. The interesting thing in this case is that this uh, uh, painting of Lundqvist did stay with them in Texas and was hung in their house, which was a log house, uh, seven miles south of Fredericksburg. This is a, an, an, uh, an image of Herman and his wife Elizabeth Petri Lunkfitz comforting the twins. They had just had, had uh, twins, so Herman's got one, and his expression's like, how long can this go on? And <laughs> meanwhile, uh, we've, we've got Elizabeth, who's simultaneously holding a twin, but also giving some water to little Marta. Uh, meanwhile, Max is rocking back and forth on a chamber pot. <laughs> Somehow, I think this is not going to end well. <sighs> 
But uh, by the way, uh, little Marta, uh, fast forward about uh, 17 years, and she's going to be the first woman employed by the state of Texas as a permanent employee. She worked at the General Land Office, and, which was also where uh, Herman was, was, was working as a photographer. But the, the interesting point is it's this, this very simple log structure, uh, although it does have a shelf for a clock uh, over the doorway there, but check there in the, the corner there. Oh, there's, there's Herman's portrait hanging there in this rustic log, log cabin. There's this image of his sophistication as a, as a, as a European uh, gentleman, beautifully done. And this, in fact, did descend in the family. Uh, it, uh, Marta ended up marrying uh, Julius Bickler. And so it went to them, and then it went to their son, Ralph Bickler, and then Ralph's widow, when she passed away, it ended up going to the governor's mansion, so the provenance. It stayed in the family until it went to the governor's mansion, so that's, that's pretty cool. And uh, here's another pair, which we can assume, Petri was the big portrait specialist, Lungfitz, that, that just wasn't his bliss, he was more of a landscape guy. Um, but here is Herman's uh, dad and mom, mom came with them to Texas, dad had passed away, and he was actually the owner of a hosiery factory in uh, Halle Andersal, and um, he, he was not very keen on Herman becoming a painter. He wanted him to go to work in the company business. Hmm. Um, and uh, Herman tried that for a while, but ended up uh, uh, going off to, uh, uh, to, to, to Dresden. Um, in addition to individual portraits, you can also find German immigrant, immigrant painters attempting to do group portraits. This is probably the most ambitious group portrait. And my, my good friend Sam Ratcliffe, who uh, uh, sat, sat with me at the seminar table with, with Dr. Getzman back in the good old days uh, in, in Austin, uh, discusses this very well in his book on painting Texas history. And there's a, it, it certainly is something that helps us inform, inform our understanding of history, but it's not really actually a historical moment. It, it really does seem to me to be a fairly complicated collection of individual portraits. Uh, of uh, Major James Longstreet, a whole variety of Indian scouts, guides, etc., uh, Native Americans, who not many of them were actually finished off at this point, and in the background, Fort Martin Scott. Now, the dating of this t painting tends to be 1853, which was two years after Patrian Lundqvist showed up in the Hill Country, to 1857, which is a definite end date for Patry since he died in that year. But the interesting thing is that 1853, the date is when Fort Martin Scott ceased to be a, a U.S. military installation. The frontier was pushing to the west. And so when, when we think about that in terms of what was, was Richard Patry trying to do, it seems to me that there may even be sort of a commemorative function uh, to this painting, uh, uh, that, that, that it was actually marking the closing of the fort as the, the, the frontier was, uh, was moving on. So uh, very interesting uh, thinking about this. And uh, Ron Tyler, who is here in the audience, pointed out the, the way in which there's a sort of multicultural complexity to this painting when he gave the keynote address at, at the David Warren Symposium a couple years ago. And I think that's very true. And one of the most interesting things uh, about it, and I don't know whether that is one of the things that's informing the sort of commemorative nature here, the sort of, I don't know, maybe it's utopian optimism that everything was gonna go okay and that, that the army and the Germans and the Indians were all going to get along. It's, it's going to be fine, yeah. And we know that that didn't happen for a long, 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 long time. But intriguing to, to speculate about what was going on inside Petri's mind as far as the point of this uh, very interesting painting. And there are just a couple of uh, close-ups of figures. Now, Luisa Vusta, when she moved to Texas, she uh, moved to San Antonio and almost immediately set up her studio in San Antonio. Um, and it, her initial studio was in this building, the French building, that had just been built a couple years uh, earlier. But she's advertising in a local paper that I am available to, to paint your portrait and presumably you know, she was in one of these upper rooms, and this is sort of the more or less north side of the building, as north as you can get in San Antonio, um, the, the arrangement of the streets being a little uh, wonky. But uh, this was her uh, initial studio, and the, the image that you've now seen a couple times, the one on the left, the one that really is, needs to be shrunk a little bit, um, is, is a very beautiful uh, self-portrait that she did 
of herself. But, uh, and, and this, of course, is in Cecilia Stein Steinfeld's wonderful catalog of the witty, not in Cecilia's catalog is the, the more recent acquisition, you can see from the accession number acquired in 2005, of her daughter, Adelina, who was named for one of Louise's sisters back in, in Germany. And it's kind of an interesting comparison, thinking about Louisa's uh, self-portrait in terms of the portrait of Hermann Lungfitz and the sort of uh, careful, studious gaze of the, the painter looking back at the, 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 uh, uh, the, the viewer. The, uh, the painting of the daughter, and this is like a young, young woman about to become a young mother in San Antonio, but I don't think that's a San Antonio background. <laughs> And in fact, if you think about uh, the portrait of Adelina in the context of uh, the Dusseldorf School and the, the way in which um, uh, portraits or group portraits, in, in this case, were, were framed, that sort of um, a beautiful blue sky background is something that she certainly could, would have been uh, uh, aware of, uh, Louisa, that is, in the context of creating this portrait of her daughter. And um, uh, Adelina, had married Heino Stoffel, and so they ended up living in this little house, which uh, is still in San Antonio. Um, uh, very near, I forget the name, is it a Marriott Hotel that's, uh, that's right there uh, by the, the German English school? And you can actually see, this is Adelina's house right here. Um, here's the, the German English school, and in fact, Louisa ended up doing some teaching in the women's department side of the German free school, so she's, she's a portraitist, but she's also teaching. I have a feeling that, you know, it, it, had she been alive in Texas in the 20th or 21st century, she'd be on a faculty of a, of a, a university somewhere, but that was not in the San Antonio scheme of things uh, at that point. But um, the Sanborn map, here's the German English school here, here's daughter's house. And the interesting thing is by 1870, Louisa is actually not living with her daughter. And I think the kids were growing by that point. And this little house is getting smaller and smaller and smaller with the, the size of the family growing. So in 1870, she's actually living up here, which is this house right here, the Gresser house, which is still, still standing on uh, uh, Presa Street. The interesting thing about this is that when Herman Lunkwitz and his family moved from the hill country into San Antonio, they rented a house, unfortunately, it's just cut off right there, but that was the house that the Lungfitzes rented and just cut off there, so there's the Stoffel house as well. Um, so this was a very Germanic neighborhood. This is actually, the, the pink building right there is the St. John's Lutheran Church, which was the, one of the, the, the main German churches, St. Joseph's for the Catholics and St. John's for the, the Lutherans. So this area, which, and this is La Villita up here, uh, all, all very much tied, tied in with that. And interestingly enough, when Ida Weisselberg Hadra got married in 1882, she moved to San Antonio and her house was this one right over here. So there, there are spatial geographic ways that we can be thinking of these painters, sometimes interacting with each other, other times, you know, Ida's, Ida's there after a point where uh, Luisa Vusta had been dead for uh, a decade, uh, and Herman Lunkwitz was no longer in San Antonio, but they, they keep getting drawn to that same neighborhood just on the banks of the San Antonio River. One other, just a quick mention of another uh, portrait, a uh, group portrait by Luisa Vusta. This one's out at the Winedale Historical Center, and it's the, uh, the B children, the, uh, the, the children of General Hamilton B. Um, which, uh, again, is interesting to me. I mean, it's very impressive if you think about this in terms of, I know the, the, the poses are a little stiff and, and all. it looks like it's like a group of, of four portraits pasted together onto a canvas, but when you have a group of children who are ranging in age from six to two, the idea of having them stay in one place for five minutes, you know, that's a pretty, pretty daunting challenge that she's taking on there. So I think we can give her a little bit of a pass in terms of the, 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 the interaction of the figures, but quite striking to me uh, is the background, which is this kind of rocky background, a bit of sky here, the trailing vines here, there's a little bit of a waterfall right there, and down here, this detail is LW, uh, uh, which was the, a way that she tended to sign her paintings. But this, this rocky background is very unusual. This is not the sort of background that you would get in a standard Anglo-Texan painting. And actually, if we look at this painting, Luisa's uh, painting of the bee children, and this is her uh, brother-in-law, um, 
uh, Carl Friedrich Lessing, and his painting, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the robber and his child. This is sort of a uh, Les Mis before there was Les Mis. You know, it's, it's the person who's driven to a life of crime by unfortunate circumstances, and here he is, you know, head in hand uh, with, with an exhausted child. But set in this landscape here, with, it's this, they're up on a, a rocky ledge, um, but with this beautiful landscape in the background. And this was painted at a point when Louisa was still living in Dusseldorf, and so uh, I'd, I'd be very surprised if she wasn't familiar with these sort of paintings. It's one of those, those Germanic ideas about how you handle a, the background of a painting that, that uh, was incorporated in her portraiture. And, you know, you can kind of get the, the, the sense of, of difference here between the Bee children and the portrait of the Jones children of Galveston, which is Timothy Flintoff. So you've got the, the Germanic attitude on the left and then the uh, Anglo-American atti attitude. And this is actually, you know, the, the, the Jones children is a pretty sophisticated and complicated um, uh, group portrait here, but handled in a different way than, uh, than the Bee children was. One final portrait just to, to uh, remind us of our uh, end, end of session uh, person, and that's uh, Julius Stockfleth in Galveston. And Stockfleth was from, from northern Germany, um, and uh, he was born in 1857, the year Richard Petri died. So it's not like, you know, they were all hanging out together. Uh, and in fact, he didn't come to Texas until the 1880s. But in addition to his famous paintings, the maritime paintings, the, 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 the views of the wars of, Gal War of, of Galveston and um, uh, some streetscapes, he also did do some portraits. And this is actually uh, Alfred Muller, who was uh, an architect in Galveston, and his wife. It's kind of interesting. It, seem, it seems like he's not the most comfortable in terms of flesh tones. That really didn't come up much in his street views or, or other types of, uh, of views. But uh, quite, quite nicely done portraits. It's kind of interesting when you look at this and you see the, the, uh, a photograph of Alfred Muller, and you begin to think, hmm, now is this actually, was this from life or was this from the, the, the photograph? Because they are extremely close, and Muller died at a relatively early age. So one, the, the date that you see on the painting there, 1887, is based on the date of the marriage, and that's kind of predicate, predicated on um, you know, the, the, the portraits having been done at the time of the, the marriage. But it may be that it's a little late, and she actually lived on in Galveston, survived the, the, the storm. So, kind of complicated, in, something that needs to be explored some more. One other group portrait, we might say, is this well-known painting by Carl von Ivansky, the theater at the Casino Club in San Antonio. And the date of this, 1858 to 60, is based on the, the date that the, the, the Casino Club's new building was uh, created. This is interesting because it's, it's a, a portrait of the creme de la creme of San Antonio German society uh, on the eve of the Civil War. Um, it's also interesting in that it's a painting that also incorporates a very large painting, this backdrop here, and there, there are various and sundry stories about that, that this was done by Herman Lungfitz and his uh, friend uh, uh, William C. A. T. Lepapi. Ivansky may have had a hand of it. So it's, it's actually kind of, it gets kind of meta in terms of being a painting of a painting, which is the backdrop for theatrical presentations. And Germans were very ambitious about bringing uh, German literature, German music, and other forms of German culture with them to the new world. It wasn't like, you know, you're in Texas, drop everything and, and you know, start all over again. There, there was a great, great deal of German culture that was brought with them, including, of course, uh, some of these attitudes about painting that we're talking about. But here is the casino uh, building, which uh, was on Market Street in San Antonio, backing up to the San Antonio River, and uh, this, uh, this building has been long gone, but this is actually part of the site of what's now the Briscoe Museum of Western Art. So just, just to, to sort of get you oriented uh, right there. And in fact, you can see the, the fly area of the stage so that this area here is directly underneath that. So, and, and the San Antonio River is just behind this. And speaking of San Antonio, here we begin to get something that isn't a portrait, isn't a landscape, but, uh, uh, you know, there's that, that catch-all 
concept of genre painting, which basically means anything that's not a history painting or a landscape or, or a portrait, does, doesn't do, do, do much to help us. But this is one of my favorite Hermann Lundqvist paintings because there's so much incident and accident going on uh, in this painting. And it is Crockett Street, San Antonio, uh, 1857. And it's a cool painting because it's, it's San Antonio being documented by a German, uh, but in this interesting state of transition. We've got uh, a very strong horizon line here, but we have the Church of San Fernando on the main plaza sort of popping up smack dab in the middle of the composition. But we also have St. Mary's, the Irish Catholic Church, it's part of that transition in San Antonio. But we also have the remains of San Antonio de Valero, the Alamo, and that too is at a point of transition because you can see that it now has a new roof, nice, nice hipped roof there put on by the U.S. Army as they're using it uh, as a, a, a munitions station. And once you create that roof, they say, uh-oh, we don't have anything in the front. And so they ended up hiring Johann Fries, a local German stonemason, to create a parapet that would block that the, the, would, would finish off the roof and enclose that space. And so that was brand new. This was probably seven, six or seven years old when Herman Lundqvist did this painting. And so that famous curvilinear parapet, the Alamo motif, uh, created by a German stonemason. So uh, a pretty interesting uh, in, terms, in terms of that. In addition, you also have the Germanic feature of this nice rock house. Uh, and this was the house of Wilhelm Tielepapi, and that's uh, Tielepapi who became the first German Texan mayor of San Antonio after the Civil War. There's also a careta uh, with two Hispanic gentlemen uh, moving things through the, the, the city, very characteristic of old San Antonio. And then this gentleman here, uh, supposedly is Wenzel Friedrich, who uh, is more famous now as one of the progenitors of those Texas horn chairs. I noticed that there was one over in the, the, the gallery that's attributed to uh, Wenzel Friedrich, and the, that supposedly is him. In fact, his house and shop were right there. So whether it's him or not, it was actually incorporated in the image. And in, in fact, here is a Sanborn fire insurance map showing this area. And one of Lundqvist's students uh, recalled many years later that Lundqvist had gone up in a tower of the uh, uh, Honoré Grenet house and store. And see that tower right there? It's behind this store. This is uh, Nacogdoches Street, so Crockett Street's running this way. And this is actually Wenzel Friedrich's home and shop, which is pretty cool. So this is the grounds of the Alamo over here. And that's just the edge of the Tila Poppy. And so you can see there's the Tila Poppy house. Here's the Alamo. <coughs> and here's the Grenet house. And so that little square right there, that's the tower. So Herman Lundqvist was climbing that tower to, uh, to get this panoramic view of the city of San Antonio. And we'll see that in a number of Lundqvist's paintings where he's actually looking for a view where he can see uh, so well above and, uh, uh, above and beyond the normal kind of street view, if, if you will. Now, uh, it, I've kind of wondered, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you get to see what a junky backyard a carpenter has. All, all the wood refuse just sort of, oh, dump it over the fence. Um, which you can see in a lot of uh, uh, Sanborn maps, there's these fire hazards created by, you know, lumber yards putting their, their stray, stray unsellable pieces of lumber in piles near, near the main building. Um, but uh, it, struck, it struck me, this is such an interesting view, and, but it's such an elevated view. How the heck did this photo get taken? Well, if you look at the Augustus Koch bird's eye view from the opposite side, here's Alamo Plaza. There's the chapel of the, the mission. There's the Grenet house and store. There's the tower. And here's the, the, the area where the Friedrich house is. Hmm. Do you reckon about there? Or maybe there so that the view is coming this away, and that was the Menger Hotel, so, which uh, the front part of the Menger was built, this part here, built 1860. It turned out to be such a smash hit that they were very rapidly adding on to the back. And in fact, this part right here is the Menger Brewery, because if you have a hotel, you better be serving beer or things are going to get sour very quickly. So uh, be that as it may, this, this historic photo 
was probably taken from either one of these rooms or from the top floor of the brewery looking in that direction. And you sort of wonder, who took this photo? Well, Herman Lundqvist moved to San Antonio in 1864 and in the late 1860s went into the photographic business with Carl von Ivansky. In fact, that painting of, of Ivansky that we saw at the very beginning may well have been taking, taken by his partner as well. So uh, it may well be that we're looking here at a photo by Herman Lundqvist of the tower where he did the painting of Crockett Street, San Antonio. So, um, Another 1850s painting is uh, Ginther's Mill on Live Oak Creek, which uh, is another really interesting one. This is seven miles south of Fredericksburg. It's on Highway 16, the, the Kerrville Highway. And so centered in it is the, the mill of Carl Hilmer Ginther. And it's at this point set up for, as a sawmill, but it could also you know, be for processing grain, the other main point of, uh, of a mill. But in addition to the mill, which is in the center of the picture, you can see the log houses that the, the, the Ginthers uh, bought when they purchased this land in 1850-51, but their brand new rock house, which uh, he was, uh, uh, Carl Henry Ginther was very proud of. And in fact, here's a, a detail uh, of it. And a floor plan of the house, which you can see in my Guide to Historic Buildings of Fredericksburg in Gillespie County. Um, and another little product placement there. Um, and although there's a partition now, it's basically one front room and then a lean-to back room, and then there's some modern additions here. Um, but uh, another documenting of a German Texan industry and prosperity in the, 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 the 1850s. And in fact, Carl Hilmer Ginther uh, was paying for this painting to be made so he could send it back to his family in Germany. See what I've done. See how much progress we're making here uh, in, in Texas. So kind of cool to, uh, to see that. It's, it's, that painting has always been confusing to me because this is what Lundqvist shows in 1855. And then this is the historic photo, the first historic photo we have, which is from like 25 years later. And here's what it looks like today, which is pretty close to what you see here, but with the addition of a Victorian porch, which may have gone on just a couple of years after this photo was taken. But this is actually the view on Highway, on highway 16 and crossing over Live Oak Creek as it moves into the, into the Perdinalis. Um, I was talking with, with, with uh, a friend last night about Fredericksburg and the changes that it's undergone and the way in which 290 is now a string of wineries from, from Johnson City to Fredericksburg. And this house is uh, um, actually being converted into a winery uh, as, as we speak. So you might, you might be able to get some, uh, some uh, Chardonnay uh, grown from the, uh, the, the winery here in the very near future. The, the challenge for Lundqvist was that living in the hill country, as, as friends like Carl Hilmer Ginther moved into San Antonio and found the pioneer flour mills, it begins to get lonelier and lonelier. Richard Petrie died in 1857. The Ginthers moved away in 1860. Uh, the Civil War broke out, and it was a scary time to be a German, especially if you weren't really enthusiastic about the Confederacy, and there were a lot of Germans who were not. And at a point where you had things like the Nueces Massacre and German farmers being taken out and shot or hung, uh, that is the point where Lundqvist really turns to pure landscape in a way. And I guess it's sort of inevitable that you know, there, there was no economic growth or prosperity happening during the Civil War. Um, so he ends up ramping up his interest in the, uh, the uh, nature around him, like Enchanted Rock. And this is one of the, uh, the two paintings of Enchanted Rock that are at the, the, the Witte Museum. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, it's, it's intriguing to me because although it's of the rock, the rock itself, the, the giant dome of granite, is really a pretty small portion of the canvas. And in fact, there are all these interesting geological formations that uh, are actually more prominent in the painting. And I think that that goes back to that Germanic training as well. That, uh, that, um, and here actually is another painting that, that presumably shows enchanted rock. Uh, of uh, Captain Jack Hayes, uh, long story which we have no time for. But the, the granite, ask me at the break, um, the, the, the sort of granite outcroppings and figures were, were seen by everybody, Comanches, Anglos, Germans, as being this enchanted landscape. That, that there was a sort of animate quality 
to it that, uh, that made it particularly eerie. And that was the reason why Captain Jack went to Enchanted Rock was that the Comanches, uh, their philosophy was don't mess with the rock. So that he was able to, to, to survive uh, by, uh, by perching on the rock until reinforcements showed up. But it's interesting that that, that Friedrich painting of Der Watzmann has uh, uh, stone formations in the foreground that are very similar to these. And I think they were, that, that German painters were drawn to this as, as having a sort of animate quality to it. Um, the interesting thing about this is that for Germans, they, they didn't use enchanted rock. The name for it was Versauberter Felsen. Versauberter, uh, basically meaning enchanted or magic. Uh, if uh, opera buffs in the, the audience will know that Mozart's The Magic Flute is Die Zauberflute. And so there, there's this sort of enchantment, magic. And this was actually out of the first um, uh, history of Fredericksburg, which uh, in 1896, on the 50th anniversary of the founding of Fredericksburg, hey, let's get together and publish a book. <laughs> and, and so they did. And so this was the, the caption. And this is one of the few things that's actually in English in the whole book, um, is Enchanted Rock, but then Versauberter Felsen in there as well. So we know that there was, there, there was a distinct German phrase for uh, that. But the interesting thing, the only other thing I'll say about Enchanted Rock is that to get to this, this is not an up-close view of the rock or of the scene, and that we're, uh, we're you to follow Herman's tracks today. This is Sandy Creek heading towards meeting up with Crab Apple Creek, and that, that here is the, the, the main rock, but he's way the heck over here, sort of the eastern edge of what's, what's now the Enchanted Rock State Natural Area. So the view back so that you get the, this sort of framing motif is coming out of being up here on a bluff overlooking the, the creek. So uh, once again, just as in Crockett Street, San Antonio, he's looking for that sort of lofty perch where he can get the whole, um, the, 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 uh, the, a dramatic perspective on the picture. Somewhat more intimate and direct is uh, Hill Country Landscape of 1857. And uh, this is interesting as well. Uh, just like Enchanted Rock was well known before Herman Lunkfitz painted it, so too uh, scenes of the, the Guadalupe River or the Perdinalis River were well known at the time. And in fact, uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted had written about it, published in 1857, about the beauties of the Guadalupe, particularly in the area near Sisterdale. And that's an area where the, that we know that Lundqvist was in because his famous uh, 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 lithograph of Dr. Ernst Kapp's water cure was in the Sisterdale era, area. And in fact, this uh, cypress tree um, is uh, uh, based on a drawing in the Now Collection that, uh, that, that documents Sisterdale, July of 1853. So we know that, that even though the painting you know, dates to 1862, that, that, that it's drawing on elements that he had uh, uh, earlier. And the whole, the, there's an interesting, in addition to the enchantment and the magic of enchanted rock. There's also a, a, a long German tradition of thinking about cypress trees. And uh, there was even a sort of short story written by Hermann Seeley of New Braunfels uh, called Die Cypressa. And uh, when it was, it was not published in his lifetime. It was not published until 1936 in New Braunfels, but it has a, a set of, of little I don't know if they're woodcuts or some sort of engraving that are based uh, on Seeley's own drawings. But these limestone caves mark a point of entry into a mysterious cavern that's actually the home of a Native American tribe. And so there's this whole fantastic story that's, that's going on here. And uh, of course, Lungfitz has this, this cavern off to the side as well. And here's another image. When you go inside that rock, you find yourself in this huge chamber. And it looks like you're in the Pantheon in Rome or something. So uh, they fixed it up quite nicely, apparently. Um, but so it's, it's this strange little story that focuses on the mysterious character of hill country landscapes. And uh, in fact, it ends with, after the, our, our hero escapes from being caught by the natives, he is um, unable, uh, uh, no one is able to find that entrance into the to that enchanted chamber again. So the, and uh, Herman Lundqvist and Herman Seeley probably knew each other. They were both heavy into singing societies. And so, you know, there, there tended to be state singing 
contests and things like that. So quite likely that they were uh, aware of each other. One other pure landscape, West Cave on the Perdinalis. We're now uh, another 20 years down the line from, uh, 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 from Enchanted Rock and from Hill Country Landscape. And this one's in, in the collection of, of Bill Hill, which is a really cool uh, uh, painting, uh, obviously much smaller than this, but it's quite striking, and we didn't really talk about the time of day of the Enchanted Rock uh, painting, but, but Lundqvist is clearly very focused on capturing precise time of day, and the same thing is true here. Uh, West Cave, this is actually the west side of this little creek bed that leads into the Perdinalis, um, so that this, um, the, the fact that this is the, the west face here, you can see that this is in sunlight, this is in sunlight, um, so it, it's uh, some sort of early to mid-afternoon view. Uh, it's a strongly horizontal composition all the, all the way across. And uh, two months ago when I was in Houston at, at Bayou Bend, I uh, pointed out there's a tree stump there. And guess what kind of tree it is? It's a cypress. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, and so of course you have to do the whole art history thing and say, like, oh yes, the, the sign of civilization, the natural tree being chopped down and, 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 and then my wife and I uh, went to West Cave, which is now a, a natural preserve, uh, a week or so after the, 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 the Warren Symposium, the doggone tree is still there. <laughs> Herman chopped down the tree for his painting because it was messing with his horizontality. <laughs> Thanks, Herman. Um, well, and, and so, and they were happy to inform us that they've done dendrochronology on the tree and it's 400 years old, so it had to have been there when Lundqvist did his painting. And um, the, the other thing to note is that there are a couple of figures there. In the 1880s, West Cave was already becoming a tourist attraction. So, I mean, there, there are ways in which we're transitioning out of uh, natural landscape. There's a, a, there's a view of the actual entrance into the cave, which is over here, this newer part of limestone. This is part of a, a, a limestone uh, ceiling of the cave that collapsed. And there's the interior of the cave where our intrepid tourists are in this, in this photo. Well, just to finish up, because uh, we are uh, actually up to 10.30, so I'm trespassing into Scott's time right now. Um, a really interesting painting, Swenson's Ruin of 1873. Um, and uh, Swante M. Swenson was a Swedish immigrant to Austin, did very well, started to build an impressive mansion for himself east of Austin in Govali, and uh, ended up having to abandon it with the outbreak of the Civil War. And so it's this fascinating, there, there aren't that many ruins in the New World, and you know, the, there's a lot of tropes about that. Oh, you know, only Europe has the antiquity and the ruins and the things that make for great landscape paintings. Well, when Herman saw a ruin, he straight made a beeline for it. Okay, this is cool. Uh, and it's fascinating because it's this impressive stone house on a hillside, but look at all of these stones here. You know, he's really getting this sort of um, uh, rugged landscape but then, with this one piece of very finished cornice in the foreground there, but, but flat on its back, basically. So it's a portrait, you know, if, if Enchanted Rock is about, you know, dreams of enchantment and mysticism and magic, this is about Dash dreams and the dream of, of uh, S.M. Svensson that, that he could build a house like that and that it was not going to be all blown away by the Civil War. Um, from about the same time, the Texas Military Institute, uh, 1874. Um, the year after this was painted, it appeared in print in Edward King's book, The Great South, sort of a tourist book. Here is actually the view that he was painting from. You can actually see that from right about here. Um, this is West Avenue, and I think that, that Herman was on West Avenue and looking over to the, the Texas Military Institute. Now, it's interesting that in the painting, you get this very idyllic view of Shoal Creek, very park-like, framed uh, on the right side by stones once again, but very lovely. If he had chosen as his site not up here, but right here, in the foreground of the Military Institute would be the series of slave quarters from Bishop Alexander Gregg, the Episcopal Bishop of Texas, whose house was up here, oh, wait, wait, up here, and this is 12th Street, 
So you go down, cross over, and here was the slave quarter. He very thoughtfully put his slave quarters in the floodplain. But uh, if those, those of you who are familiar with Austin, where the tavern is, <laughs> it's, it's right in that area, uh, right there. Very quickly, Ida, Ida Weisselberg Hadra was a student both of Lundqvist and of Elamas Duval, two beautiful drawings that she did. Obviously, Lundqvist was, was able to give her some great training uh, in the, the depiction of trees, extremely detailed, beautifully done. And she did some remarkable paintings. I think this one is almost on the surreal side, uh, which is a view of Austin at the Witte Museum. The reason I think, think of it as surreal is that she's having some real scale problems here with some of these. This is actually the, uh, this house is this house. This is 1873, so this is almost, well, we, we don't have a date on this other than it's before the date of her marriage. But this is supposedly the uh, North Evans Chateau, and this is from a slightly different angle. That, this house has been replaced by a grand Victorian mansion. It's still there. But this house is supposed to be this, and it looks like it's going to be here. And this church is up here, one block over. So it really compresses all of these elements of Austin and, in fact, manages to work in the Texas Military Institute in the background and Mount Bunnell, which is nowhere, you know. So it's, it's a, a composite on a very serious scale. Um, but the, uh, after she moved to San Antonio, she did a couple of important views of the San Antonio River. This one uh, is uh, actually a view of the old Alamo Ironworks, and then this is a, a Ben calls the San Antonio River at St. Mary's uh, Street. Here's the Alamo Ironworks, and this is it was right next door to the casino building, so it's also on Market Street. Um, in fact, you, here's Market, here's the Foundry, here's the Casino. So Ida is probably setting up her easel right about here, which is interesting because do you notice that there is a dam right there? And there is that dam on the Sanborn fire map. So she's viewing this way, catching the buildings of the fire uh, of the Foundry, not putting the, the, the uh, uh, or de-emphasizing the, the back side of the casino club, which is kind of interesting. But this is the site of the Briscoe Museum today. Uh, but it's this interesting view, and the Alamo Ironworks, depending on when she painted it, they were just moving over closer to the railroad tracks uh, because it was a very noisy uh, so, uh, 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 operation. So it, it almost has a, a sense of being a bit ruinous. So it may be after they had moved over to the, the iron tracks, but uh, to, to the railroad tracks. But this painting has always been said that it's on St. Mary Street, and I've not been able to just go crazy trying to match it up with, the, uh, with any Sanborn map or any building that's projecting out onto the river like that. But here is the bird's eye view, and this, do you notice this bridge here? This is 1873. <laughs> There's some grumpy commuters driving their wagon through the river, um, but this, uh, bridge was replaced by a nice new cast iron bridge. This is Presa Street, uh, at this point called, Pace uh, right, I'm sorry, Navarro Street, and Presa Street's right here. And there's the casino right there, and that's the, the ironworks property. So this is not the bridge that Ida was on. She was on a nice new cast iron bridge, which I think is this one. And that actually this painting was probably done from this angle here. And the, as far as I can tell, the, the attribution of this as being on St. Mary Street, which would be on the north side of, of downtown, uh, came from the family. Um, of course, this was also the family that said that this was at San Pedro Springs, <laughs> up by the, uh, the, the, the Witte. And Cecilia Steinfeld said, no, this is, this is actually the, uh, the Alamo Ironworks. And I think we need to revise the, the identification of this painting as well. And it's actually uh, San Antonio River at the Navarro Street Bridge. And finally, and then I'll uh, hush up, just a, a quick note about uh, the, the, the end of the century paintings of Julius Stockpleth, the two paintings of um, the, the hurricane of September 8th, 1900. And it's a, a, a very dramatic uh, painting. The thing that interests me about this is that you have one surviving building, the, the Gresham House by Nicholas Clayton, but also Nicholas Clayton's uh, Sacred Heart Church, uh, which is, uh, uh, as you can see, in a rather horrific state. Um, I've always been confused about that because 
Sacred Heart Church is on this lot right now, but the Sanborn map shows us that the original Sacred, Sacred Heart was facing Broadway, and there's the Gresham house. Um, but in terms of how, and uh, Stockfleth lost several family members in the hurricane, so that he was probably wandering around Galveston looking for them or their remains or something, and may not have had time to sketch it, but almost immediately, this image was published in a book called Album of Galveston, The Day Before and the Day After. And, you know, it's really a terrifying image. The roof has been blown off, and, you know, there's just the upper level, the chancel. And by golly, that was documented in this photograph at a very early date. So um, uh, it, it seems pretty clear to me that if he didn't sketch this at the same time that this photo was being taken, he could have referred to it in the book. And finally, the other example of the meteorological sur uh, sublime, the Tremont St Street Galveston during the flood. And once again, you can't actually see the street. Take, take our word for it that this is, in fact, Tremont Street. You know that, actually, because of the Tremont Hotel here in the background. And here is the Sanborn maps. And so Stockfleth is at a point of view right here. Here's the levee building right here. And there is the Tremont Street Hotel here. And once again, the, 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 the book on uh, the, the, the hurricane shows photographs of the Tremont Street. It's actually from the other side here. The photo's taken from up here. But also uh, the levee building, which has just been completed the year before and is still standing today. But it's kind of interesting when you think about that in terms of the, the stock painting and the documentation from the photograph. So he was able to take the, this, the photographic evidence of the storm and turn it into sort of a sublime statement of the power of nature. And in spite of all the progress that was made in Texas over the 50 years since Lundqvist had arrived, uh, still dependent upon the power of nature not to be blown away. So it's a, a long, strange trip uh, filled with interesting canvases. Uh, enjoyed presenting it to you and hope you enjoyed it.